Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now if you're buying a modern graphics card like the 16 gig Radeon RX 9060 XT then you're probably intending to pair it with a modern system, one that can take full advantage of what this new GPU has to offer. We've already looked at how the card performs at 1440p and considering 16 gigabyte models start at about £330 here in the UK, I think it's a good choice for the money. Here is a reminder of how it runs. I've got footage from the card running games as part of a PCIe 5.0 system with rebar enabled and the card is hitting its maximum clocks. Best case scenario basically. But let's take things down a notch. This is the AMD FX 6330. It's very similar to the FX 6300 or 6350 which can both be had for a few quid and honestly in 2025 any performance differences between slight skew variations will likely be smaller than they ever were. Any FX chip for that matter will struggle in a lot of gaming scenarios these days. But how bad could it be? We've done this sort of thing before, but I usually use NVIDIA cards, so why not give one of AMD's offerings a try? Actually, I almost had to use NVIDIA again because the 9060 XT just refused to display an image to start with. I had read a couple of articles regarding support and sort of expected this, but it's not over yet. The solution to this problem was simple but weird. I removed the AMD card, put an NVIDIA RTX 5060 in the system, instead booted to Windows, shut down the PC and then swapped back to the AMD card. After doing this, I had no more problems. I thought driver installation would break it again, but no. That said, I did get a warning about my system setup being unsupported, but there was nothing I could do. AMD wanted me to switch to UEFI, but I couldn't. I can't. There's no option to do so in the BIOS of my M5A78L USB 3 motherboard, which by the way only supports PCIe 2.0 and lacks rebar. It does allow for the card to run in X16 mode though, so it's not all bad, and despite the warnings, I had no further issues. I even overclocked the FX 6330 to 4.5 GHz, using the chunky stock cooler and it ran perfectly, maintaining respectable temperatures. The 16 gig 9060 XT is a great card for 1440p and even better at 1080p but I decided to remain with the higher resolution for today's testing to try and lower the strain on the CPU or realistically give the GPU more to do. Yeah, I'm probably being a bit too hopeful. That said, I was surprised to see Counter-Strike 2 fully utilising the 9060 XT, with the card hitting 100% utilisation despite the huge CPU bottleneck. No, I'm just joking, this didn't really last long. Um, actually playing the game was a different story, with constant frame dips and drops, which of course were to be expected. The FX 6330 is nearly 10 years old, but the FX 6000 series dates back to 2011. The gameplay is of course from the overclocked 6330 and 9060. XT, but I'll have the comparative results from the best case scenario i9 machine on screen as well to show you the performance we're losing here. I also have the FX chip paired with 16 gigs of DDR3 1600, whereas the i9 was running with 6000 MHz DDR5. That doesn't matter as much as the CPU limitation though. Also, I labelled the chip wrong in the overlay, so some results may say FX 6300 instead of 6330. CS2 hits 37 FPS overall with the FX chip, whereas we saw 241 with the i9. The graphics card was sometimes dropping to less than 1GHz as part of the FX PC, because of course the system is only as good as its weakest component, in this case the processor. The next game I tried was Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, just the usual causing carnage around town and annoying all the local NPCs. Even as part of the FX setup, the GPU sometimes hit at least 80% utilisation and honestly, I was surprised at how good this felt to play. Now I'm not saying it was a good experience overall, but compared to what I was expecting, it was quite acceptable. The frame time graph was a bit all over the place, but there were no huge stutters or drops, at least based on this part of the map. Bigger towns may noticeably impact performance because of all the NPCs and goings on, but from what I've seen here, not bad. The i9 machine delivered just shy of 30 frames per second more. The experience was also smoother, but not a bad result from the FX 6300. There's some life left yet. 
Cyberpunk 2077 up next and with the FX CPU there were a couple of problems, this was before even getting into the game. Loading times were atrocious with the title screen taking a couple of minutes to appear and once it did it crashed. This only happened once so it only took about 5 minutes from the moment I clicked play to getting into the graphics menu, so it wasn't the worst experience I've had in Cyberpunk believe it or not. Once we were in though the game wasn't completely terrible, doesn't sound like a compliment I know but it is, honestly. In the areas with less going on, less crowds and less vehicles, there were moments of 60 plus FPS, even as things got busier we've still got over 30 FPS, although there was some horrendous stuttering. Our average performance was basically cut in half compared to the card running at its best. Of course we also have the option of frame generation, now it's not something I particularly like to be completely honest and I usually avoid in performance benchmarks, here though I'll take any help I can get. Ideally we want a solid base frame rate to start with, at least 60, and obviously that isn't the case here so we ended up uh, with a higher on paper average with a game that still feels very choppy to play. It was worth a try though eh? And again, we can't demand too much from this decade old FX chip, it is trying its best. Back to another surprising result next and this time we have Red Dead Redemption 2. Outside of towns and cities where I spend most of my time the game felt very playable. It wasn't terribly inconsistent and even venturing into Valentine didn't completely decimate the performance figures. We were getting about half the performance we should from the card but we're using decent settings and the game looks great. I think the CPU overclock is probably helping a bit but I'll have to run some comparisons to see if this actually makes much of a difference these days, especially in those more severe CPU limited situations. Situations. It's another Rockstar title next, this time GTA 5 Enhanced with a bit of ray tracing. I'm using the very high RT preset and our FX and 9060 XT combo is hitting 40 frames per second, albeit with pretty solid percentile lows. The GPU is still reaching over 80% utilisation apparently, a lot of the time, and even during explosions and NPC heavy scenarios, the FX chip didn't cause any drops below 30 FPS. Considering I didn't think this combo would even work, I don't think this is bad at all. Everything factored in. Last but not least we have Apex Legends. I haven't thrown the absolute latest and most intensive titles at this setup today because I wanted to give it a chance, not just point and laugh at how bad the FX is in 2025. We know it's not going to be great to say the least, but I wanted to showcase its capabilities rather than shun them. Anyway, over 100 FPS for Apex. First time around I fired a weapon and the game crashed to desktop, which was quite funny actually, but after that, no issues. It was pretty smooth too. Surprisingly so, to be honest. Overall this is an unrealistic pairing that no one should really consider. A modern PCIe 5.0 card running in a PCIe 2.0 system that shouldn't even run in the first place isn't an ideal configuration but it's not the worst. Maybe you've upgraded your graphics card before anything else and you want to play some games while saving up for the rest of your new parts or you're waiting for them to arrive. Gaming isn't completely off the table, at least not with an aging FX6000 series CPU. Thanks for watching, let me know your thoughts down below, leave a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you want to and you haven't done so already and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.